Well, as I walked through the door to the sanctuary this morning, got a wonderful surprise. We have with us, Terry and I, two just friends of ours, Bonnie and Terry Abbott. And uh, these are two people that were at Bethlehem Baptist Church, where I grew up at, and just wonderful, mature Christians that uh, followed the Lord and took the time to pour into my life personally uh, the wonder and the beauty of knowing Jesus Christ. And it's just a wonderful thing to have you uh, folks with us here today. And they're on their way uh, through, passing through to uh, go on vacation. And so they won't be here long enough for you to ask them embarrassing things about me. Uh, but um, we're glad that they're here. You know, uh, one of the memories that I have regarding their family, it was a, it was a typical Sunday morning there at, first, or at um, um, Bethlehem Baptist Church. Uh, this was years ago when I was just a young man and uh, sir, the service was going along just very smoothly. Uh, music went well, and then our pastor, Ralph Hodge, got up to preach, and he was preaching, a wonderful pastor. Uh, but uh, Bonnie and Terry had a, th a three-year-old daughter at that time. Her name was Corey, and Corey had to go to the bathroom, and so she slipped out the back and went to the bathroom. And then uh, uh, as she was making her way back, our pastor, as he was preaching, just stopped right in the middle of his sermon and just kind of watched... And down the aisle came Corey, dress and all, doing somersaults all the way <laughs> down the aisle. And she, she did, what's that? Her it's her daughter, yeah. <laughs> and did them all the way until got to the very front row where they were seated and, and took her place. And I think Ralph said, you know, I've always wanted to do that in a worship service. You just never know what you're going to experience and see in a worship service. And, and that, that calls us to ask a question here this morning. What should be happening in our worship services? You know, uh, this uh, year we've adopted a theme that, uh, for our church. And that theme is bridging the gaps. And we've already looked at a variety of ways in which we see gaps that can occur in our personal relationship with Christ. And here recently, we've been looking at gaps that maybe uh, can occur in the family. But you know, one of the things that I want to make sure that you're aware of is that not only are you a part of your immediate family, but if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're a member of the family of God. Amen. And that is uh, what we want to look at here this morning. We're going to take some time in the next couple of weeks to look at those gaps that can perhaps occur in the church family. And to do that, I think it's important for us to get back to some basics. So what we're going to do is remind ourselves, first of all, that as a church family, God some four or five years ago said to us as a church that what he wanted us to focus on more than anything was three things. Love God, love one another, and love the world. Now, we don't have time to look at all three of those things here today as we talk about gaps that can occur in the church family, but we are going to look at that first one, love God. And the basic way or the simplest way to understand what that means to us corporately as a church is that when we say God wants us to love Him, it means that He wants us to worship Him. The worship service is the best place for us corporately to all gather together and simply say to the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, we love you. And so we're going to focus on that here this morning. Now, you know, whether or not uh, uh, we see somersaults in a worship service or uh, musical instruments or prayer or whatever, all of that is designed really to put our focus on Jesus Christ. But you know as well as I do that there are some people, some believers, who say, yes, I'm a Christian, but they're not really engaged in any kind of corporate worship. And that's a mystery to me. I don't know, is that a mystery to you? It's somewhat mysterious to me that a person can say, yes, I, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, but as far as church or being involved in worship, that's not something I do. Have you ever heard somebody say, well, the reason I don't go to church is because I just don't get very much out of it. Have you ever heard that? Everybody go like that because I know you've heard it. Okay, all right. Sometimes people say that and then they say, well, you know, I'll just... Uh, I don't get anything out of it when I go to church. I'll just stay at home. I'll just flip on the flat screen and watch something on TV. But you know, that really shows that their emphasis and their understanding of worship is flip-flopped, that it's backwards. This morning's message is titled, Why Worship? And it's based upon Psalm 95. If you've got your Bibles, we want you to turn there because we're going to be looking more closely at this particular psalm. Psalm 95. This particular psalm really does answer the question, why worship? 
Now, while you're turning there, it's possible that even though you're here today, that maybe you're saying, you know, I'm, I'm here, but, you know, I'm really kind of here out of habit, or I'm here because mom and dad made me, or I'm here because if I don't go, I'll get in trouble with somebody in the family. But there really is an important reason why we worship, and we're going to discover that as we look at this particular psalm. Now, before we go any further, let's establish one fundamental truth that really needs to guide us before we go any further in, in this endeavor of looking at the gaps that can occur in the church family according to worship. There's a fundamental thing that we need to establish about all believers, and we're going to even put it up here on the screen so that we can make sure that we all take a look at it. Every believer has the fundamental desire to give worship to the Lord. Every believer has that fundamental desire to give worship to the Lord. Uh, let me just put it to you in, in this kind of fashion. Uh, let's say that I were to tell you that I'm a Kentucky Wildcat fan. You all know who the Kentucky Wildcats are, right? University of Kentucky. If I were to tell you I'm a Kentucky Wildcat fan, I mean, when, when uh, you cut me, I bleed blue. You know, and I, I'm just, I, if I tell you that, I am a, I am a, Kentucky Wildcat fan. But then you begin to ask me questions like, well, what do you think of their coach? And I say, well, I, I don't know who the coach is. Or you were to say, well, what do you think about their uh, players, some of them going to the uh, professionals a little bit early? And, you, and I say, well, I've never heard about that. And, and then you say, well, did, did you see the last game they played? And, I, and I'd say, well, I, I don't watch their basketball games. Well, after a while, you're going to get to the understanding or the realization that I may be saying that I'm a UK fan, but I'm really not, am I? I mean, if I don't watch the games, if I don't know who the players are, if I don't keep track of them, I'm really not a fan. You know, folks, it's pretty much the same way when a Christian says, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, but as far as worship is concerned, that, that, that's not for me. There's a real problem with that. We need to, I think, reawaken this desire that every believer has to worship the Lord. As we said, every believer has that fundamental desire to give worship to the Lord. And let's emphasize that word give, okay? You see, that really puts things in better perspective. The person who says, I go to worship, but I don't get anything out of it, most likely it's because they're not putting anything into it. And I'm convinced that, yes, when we gather for worship corporately, there are things that we receive, but I'm also convinced that we receive those things after we give what belongs to Jesus Christ. We're going to look at this Psalm 95 here and just let it answer the question, why worship? And it's very possible that through the course of this, you're going to come to the realization that maybe worship has lost some meaning in your life, but there is a way to regain that. And we want to help you regain the meaningful side of worship. So Hopefully you've got your Bibles open here, Psalm 95. We're going to try and recapture this meaningful aspect of worship, and we're going to begin by trying to complete some sentences here based on this passage of Scripture. So if you look at verses 1 through 5 there, we're going to see that worship has meaning when we give the Lord our praise. Worship has meaning when we give the Lord our praise. Let's look at verses 1 through 5. And I want you to notice this very first word, come. Did you catch that? Come. There is a call here for us to come together to worship as believers. So it says, come, let us shout joyfully to the Lord, shout triumphantly to the rock of our salvation. Let us enter his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout triumphantly to him in song. For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. The depths of the earth are in his hand, and the mountain peaks are his. The sea is his. He made it. His hands form the dry land. Now, I hope you notice there in verses 1 and 2 that three different times we are encouraged to give praise to the Lord. Did you see that? It says at the very beginning, let us shout joyfully to the Lord. And then it says, shout triumphantly to to the rock of our salvation. And then at the end of verse 2, let us shout triumphantly to him in song. Folks, we can't get away from it. It's obvious that part of worship means that we are giving something to God. And it even says that when we do that, we should be joyful. We should shout triumphantly. We should have thanksgiving in our hearts. Now, why would that take place? Why would a believer and a group of believers come together and give praise to God 
and be joyful in that and be thanksgiving in that and shout triumphantly in that, why should that be taking place? Because of what it says there in verse 3. For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. And it goes on to talk about creation. Listen, folks, if we can recapture this, this essentially is what's being told to us through God's word here this morning. The God who created the entire universe, who put the stars in the sky, who created this earth that we live on, the high places and the low places, who created the dry land and the sea, this God who was all powerful, almighty, all majestic, all love, this God has asked you to meet with him here in this place today. I don't know about you, but when I begin to think of worship in that perspective, that begins to create in me a sense of awe. Do you know what awe is? You know, uh, awe has uh, become a part of our language in the sense that we, we say that something is awesome. Have you ever used that word when you say that something? And, and really, uh, the, the meaning has gotten a little bit diluted because we'll say that anything is awesome. I mean, w when I go to the huddle house and I eat that smothered southern stuffed hash brown with, with uh, sausage and bacon and my wife says, do you enjoy it? I'll say, yeah, it was awesome. But what we're really saying is, yeah, I liked it or it was good. But you know the word awesome, the real root meaning of awesome or something that will promote awe is fear or terror. Now, I'm not saying that when we come together here that we should be afraid of the presence of God. But it does help us to understand that when we enter into this place of worship, yes, we can be relaxed. Yes, we can, we can uh, allow uh, our children to be a part of it and we can do all kinds of good things. But it also means that there's a part of our time together where we are showing awesome respect to a God who is so far above us that it required him to become like us for us to get to know him. That's all. Part of what we do in our worship service then is we, because of our awe of who God is and what he has done for us, we tell him that we love him. We praise him. We give him praise because of who he is and also because of what he has done. If you look at verse 1 there, it also says there that he is the rock of our salvation. I love that image. The rock of our salvation. Uh, guys, he, he's not the wooden platform of our salvation. He, he's not a sponge of our salvation. He's a rock of our salvation. Folks, that means that once we place our faith in Jesus Christ and we have authentically been transformed by the presence of Christ, we have a steadfastness, we have a foundation that will never be broken. And it's because of who Jesus Christ is. Amen? You're going to have to do better than that. Get ready. I don't know if this will help regain the awe that we need to have during our worship services because of the presence of God here. But perhaps just a, a slight adjustment in our attitude may help. I want you to do this. I want you to think about your life before you were saved, after you were saved. And this may not be an easy thing to do, but I want you to think about the things that you've done that were wrong, that were sinful. Think about those things. The times when you said something you shouldn't have said, when you did something that you shouldn't have done, when you treated someone discompassionately, when you made that big mistake, that moral failure. I want you to think about those things for a moment. Have you got those things in your head? All right, are you ready? Jesus saved you anyway. All those things that have happened in your life that you've done that, have go, that go against God's will and God's laws... God in his great merciful love towards you and towards me still sent his son Jesus to die on the cross to cleanse us from our sins. Knowing full well that even after we, he died on the cross for us and we placed our faith in him, that we would not be perfect from that point on, that we would continue to make mistakes and yet he died for us anyway. You know, something that keeps my feet kind of firmly on the ground is to remind myself on a regular basis that Jesus died for a wretch like me. 
one who did not deserve the blood of Christ to, be, to have been spilt even one drop. Yet he shed his blood so that I could be saved. Maybe that can help regain the awe that we need to have. Because, folks, when we enter into this place right here and we have awe of the presence of Christ, you know what that's going to eventually lead to? Praise. We won't but help but say things about Jesus that's good. So worship has meaning when we give the Lord our praise. Worship also has meaning when we give the Lord our will. Look at verses 6 and the first part of verse 7. It says, there's that word again, come. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God and we are the people of his pasture. It's saying something very simple there. Let's worship. Why? Because he's our God. I want you to notice that it says something very important. Verse 6, it says, let us worship and bow down. Do you see that? And then it says, let us kneel. Folks, there is something that's being communicated here in those two images, and it's submission. It's humility. It's putting God first and foremost in our lives. That's why we say that part of worship means that we give him our will. We submit our will to him in the midst of worship. Now, some of you are saying, don't you do that on an everyday basis? Yes, you do, but it also needs to happen in a worship service. During the worship service, we need to be saying things and, and inclining our thoughts to God to the degree where we are saying, Lord Jesus, you are my God. You see, it says it very plainly there. He's not just a great God, as it said in verse 3. Verse 6 Verse 7 says, for he is our God. That means that the God of the universe has a personal relationship with you and me through Jesus Christ. So during worship, we should be doing those things that basically say to the Lord Jesus Christ, I belong to you. You are my God. There is nothing or no one more important to me than you. You know, I know full well in my own life that what gets in the way of that is my own personal pride. You see, we're really talking about putting ourselves under the lordship of Christ, kneeling and bowing in an act of submission during our worship services. Also, that happens throughout our life, but most importantly, it needs to be happening during our worship services. But I know that what gets in my way, and perhaps it does for you, is the pride that I have in myself. You know, I can, I can do a lot of things if I put my mind to it. There's a lot of things that I can do and take care of where I don't have to depend upon God. But if there's one thing that this verse or this section is telling us is that we should be dependent upon God. Verse 7 even reminds us, For we are the people of His pasture, the sheep under His care. You know, it's awful hard to be humble before God when we're proud of all the things that we ourselves can accomplish and that we can do. I, I saw this not too long ago. I, I don't know if this will make sense to you or not, but this is called the definition of barbecuing. Everybody knows what we mean by barbecuing or grilling out. Th this is what it says. Let me just read it to you. It says, here's the real definition of barbecuing. It's the only type of cooking a real man will do, whatever that means. When a man volunteers to grill out or to barbecue, this is what happens after he says he'll do that. Number one, the woman goes to the store. Number two, the woman fixes the salad, vegetables, and dessert. Number three, the woman prepares the meat for cooking, places it on a tray along with the necessary cooking utensils, and takes it to the man who is lounging beside the grill. Number four, the man places the meat on the grill. Number five, the woman goes inside to set the table and check the vegetables. Number six, the woman comes out to tell the man that the meat is burning. Number seven, the man takes the meat off the grill and brings it and hands it to the woman. Number eight, the woman prepares the plates and brings them to the table. Number nine, after eating, the woman clears the table and does the dishes. Number 10, everyone praises the man and thanks him for his cooking efforts. And finally, number 11... The man asked the woman how she enjoyed her night off. And when he sees her annoyed look, he just comes to the conclusion, well, you just can't please some people. <laughs> My fear is that 
Sometimes we as believers treat God the way the man treated the woman. We far too often take far too much credit and say, I did this. This is a part of who I am when in fact the credit should go to Jesus Christ, to God who gives us the very breath that we breathe. Listen, I, I don't know what you're proud of in your life, what you look at as far as your accomplishments and are proud of. But I want you to know that even if you can say, I did that 100%, you're still wrong because God gave you life. God gave you talent. God gave you blessings. He gave you opportunity. Listen, when it comes down to the drill where the rubber meets the road, we owe everything to Jesus Christ. And we dare not take credit for things that he has done for us. That's what it means when we come together in worship and say, we need to give the Lord our will. We submit ourselves to Him and His plan for our life, for His will for our life. His will then becomes ours. I don't know if this will help you regain your humility before the Lord. But something that I think I have to say to myself on a regular basis is that I need Jesus constantly. I don't know if you've ever thought of it in that kind of way. But the truth of the matter is, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you need Jesus 24-7. You need Him every second of the day. You need Him because of what He has done in your life. You need Him because of what He will do in your life. You need Him because He is your Lord and Master and Savior. You need Him because your life is wrapped up in His. I want you to think about what you are most proud of. In your life, maybe there's an accomplishment, maybe something you've done, maybe maybe it's your abilities as a as a business person, maybe a hobby that you just really feel like you excel at. Just think about that right now, okay? Just just think of what you're most proud of in your life. You got it? Now listen. Take that and multiply it by a hundred times. In other words, you've now got a hundred things in your life that you are proud of that you can take credit for. All right, everybody with me? This is what I want you to know. Those 100 things that you're proud of, that you can take full credit for, still will leave you unrighteous before a holy God. The very best that we have is garbage before the Lord. When we seek to inflate ourselves and our status before God, when we try and make ourselves good before Him, we're engaged in a futile exercise. The Bible tells us that no, not one person is good. So where does our goodness come from? It comes from our submission of our will to the Lord. And that needs to happen in our worship services. Because when we submit to the Lord during our worship services... Eventually, that leads to praise, and eventually that leads to worship. Let's look at one final thing here in this passage of Scripture. Worship has meaning when we give the Lord our hearts. We're going to pick up at the very end of verse 7 and go through the rest of the psalm. It says, Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me. They tried me, though they had seen what I did. For 40 years, I was disgusted with that generation. I said, they are a people whose hearts go astray. They do not know my ways. So I swore in my anger, they will not enter my rest. Now, I want to make sure that you saw something there. At the very beginning of that section, it says, do not harden your hearts. And then it says there at the end of verse 10, they are a people whose hearts go astray. Now that clues us in here as to what this is talking about. This is reminiscent of a story back in the Old Testament in Exodus. God has delivered the people from Egypt. And they're out in the wilderness making their way to the promised land. But they've walked for three days without water. Now God has said to them previously that he will take care of them. He will provide for them. But they're getting thirsty. And you know... There's nothing wrong about getting thirsty, but they took it one step too far. They began to grumble and complain, and they said, God has abandoned us, and we would be better if we went back to Egypt. Now, this is what I want to make sure that you see here. This Psalm 95 is about worship, 
It's talking about, at this point, giving our hearts. And it uses a story from the book of Exodus in which the people had hardened their hearts toward God. And that hardening of their heart occurred because, here we go, are you ready? A lack of trust. See, there they were. God had said, I'll take care of you. But they had gone three days without water. And they said, God isn't going to take care of us. And they said, we'd be better off going back to Egypt. In other words, they said, let's disobey what God told us to do. I hope you're seeing the connection here. This lack of trust led them to a place where they said, we should disobey God. And God calls that a hardening of the heart. Now, how does that apply to a worship service? It's pretty easy. It begins, verse 7, the very end of it, it says, So today, if you hear His voice, did you catch that? When we're in worship, we should be hearing the voice of God. And when we hear the voice of God, we should not harden our hearts. In other words, we should not say, oh, I can't trust what God says He'll do. No, we should trust what God says He will do. And that trust should inevitably lead to obedience. You see, if you can trust what God says, then it's easy to be obedient to what God says. So during worship, we should be trusting that what God says to us through His Word is true, and we can count on it, and we should act on it. Let me ask you, what do you trust? What do you put your trust in, in this world? There's all kinds of things that you can put your trust in. You know, our problem isn't that we are a distrustful people. Our problem is that we put our trust in the wrong things. I remember when I was 18 years of age, Terry and I had just gotten married, and I got a job at Ford Motor Company in Louisville, Kentucky, one of the best places in that area to work. I mean, people drove 60, 80, 100 miles away just to work there at Ford Motor Company. And there I was, 18 years of age, didn't know anything about anything, but here I was working for a Ford Motor Company, making more money than I knew what to do with. But you know, it wasn't easy work. It was pretty hard work. And like I said, I didn't know anything about anything. I didn't know how to turn a wrench or put a lock in a door or anything like that. I had to learn, and I was pretty slow at learning. And the supervisors, they'd come and get on me and tell me to hurry up and do better and all that kind of thing. But I had some fellas come alongside of me, and they said, listen, j just continue to do the very best you can. And they said, but after you get your year in, you'll be in the union. And once you're in the union, you've got it made. So during those difficult times, you know, when I was getting written up or when I was, you know, being fussed at by the, the supervisors, I, I kept going. And what, what kept me going was this idea, all I have to do is get, get my year in. I'll get my year in and, and, and I'll be set from there on. I'll work at Ford Motor Company until the day I die and I'll make so much money, I'll just be a millionaire. I mean, that was my dream at 18 years of age. I got my year in. And when I got my year in, I thought, man, I have made it. A month later, they laid off the entire shift that I was working on. The oil embargo, back in the late 70s, you remember that. And I never had another opportunity to work for them ever again. Now, folks, I was trusting in something there that did not have the ability to take care of me. It made good promises to take care of me, but it was not sure. Jesus is sure. Jesus will take care of you. Jesus is someone you can put your trust in because he will not let you down. It doesn't mean that he will give you what you want, but it does mean that he will give you what you need. And you can rest assured that, as it said earlier, as the sheep under his care out in the pasture, we have a father who loves us and cares for us to the degree that even when our deepest, darkest secrets produce within us an ailment, a sickness that threatens to send us to hell forever, God took upon himself the responsibility to provide the cure for that sin, even if it required to send his son to the cross and die. That's how much he cares for you. Is there any reason then, based upon that, that we should not give him our hearts? In other words, when we hear his voice, 
we should respond and obey. When we do that, we give him our hearts. I don't know if this will help regain that aspect of worship for you, but here's a thought maybe that you can focus on that may help you. This, in, in fact, is so true that it can radically change how we live our lives. Jesus knows what's best for you. Jesus truly, really does know what is best for you. Now, there's a lot of times when I think I know what's best for me. And sometimes that's okay or doesn't cause much damage. But you know as well as I do, sometimes we do something or we engage in something that we think is best for us and it becomes a disaster. Has that ever happened in your life? Have you ever gotten involved in something or made a decision and you said, yeah, this is really going to be good for me and it just went south from day one? Jesus will never make that mistake with your life. Because you can trust him. If he says he'll take care of you, he will. If he says that he wants you to be engaged in ministry and he'll take care of you, he will. If he says he wants you to be uh, the best husband or wife or student that you can possibly be, that's what he wants and he'll help you to do that. You can trust what he says. Because he never makes mistakes. When we regain our trust in God, when we know that when we place our faith in Him, when we know that and we know it that we know it, folks, obedience then becomes a very simple matter because we trust Him. You know, folks, ultimately worship is the fundamental way that we come to know God and begin a relationship with Him. You see, when we give Him our will, when we give Him our hearts, when we give Him praise, that, that's the avenue by which we begin to build this relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And that's an important thing, that we come to know Him personally. Jesus even said that very clearly. You know, in Matthew, the seventh chapter, verses 21 through 23, this is what Jesus said about knowing Him. He said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, and do many miracles in your name? Now, what were they focusing on? They were focusing on these outward works, right? But Jesus zeroes in on the real integral part of what it means to be a part of the kingdom of heaven. He says, then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Not, well, those works weren't good enough. He says, you're not part of the kingdom because you and I never developed a relationship. A relationship in which Jesus Christ is our Lord and we are his children, his brothers and sisters, his servants. God wants to know you. He wants you to know Him. And the ultimate way that we begin that relationship in knowing Him is by giving our hearts to Him. In other words, surrendering our lives to Him. That by itself is an act of worship. And it's something that we all need to consider. I'm going to ask you to stand right now if you would please. As we come to the close of this time together, I want to ask you just a simple question. Have you given your heart to Christ? Have you given your heart to Him? In other words, have you surrendered your life to Him? Have you made Him first and foremost in your life? Is there nothing more important to you than Him? That's part of not only beginning a relationship with Jesus Christ, but it's an ongoing part of our worship of Him. Maybe you're here this morning and you need to surrender your life to Christ and allow Him to be Lord and Savior. Perhaps you're a believer who's already done that. But God has spoken to you clearly today about your attitude towards Him during worship. That He wants your praise. He wants you to surrender and submit yourself to Him. He wants you to give Him your heart, the desires of your heart. He wants you to hear Him and not only hear Him, but trust and obey Him. Maybe as a believer, you need to rededicate your life and say, Lord, I'm going to start worshiping you in the ways that you want me to worship. 
If you're here today and maybe God has said this is where you need to be a part of, uh, need to be a part of this church, this church family, and you want to join this church, or maybe you simply need to come down to this front here and just spend some time in prayer and ask the Lord to help you with the things that are on your plate coming up this week. Maybe it's to inspire or encourage you or to give you ways in which you can handle 